Hi, I'm Jeff Klein, editor of Rated Graphics, and today I'm pleased to have with us Dr. Pratesh Patel uh, from the University of Chicago Medical Center Department of Radiology, uh, who is the first author of one of our feature papers in the current March 2018 issue of Rated Graphics. His paper is entitled Multiparametric MR Imaging of Prostate Cancer uh, Following Treatment. Uh, Dr. Patel, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Klein. So, Pratesh, your paper in the current issue uh, deals with a very important topic, and it begins with an introduction that discusses the expanding treatment options uh, that we have available for prostate cancer, in particular some of the non-surgical local therapies that are now being employed in, in selected patients. Can you briefly review for us the spectrum of treatment options that are currently available uh, and touch on why it's important for radiologists to be familiar with the imaging findings, not only after standard surgical and radiation treatments, but also after receiving some of these more novel local therapies for prostate cancer. Sure. Uh, before I begin, just on behalf of Dr. Itek Oto, we'd like to thank you again for this opportunity to meet you here at RSNA. Thank you. So prostate cancer is a little different than most other cancers in that there's a wide spectrum of treatment available. On one end, you have no intervention with active surveillance or minimal intervention with hormonal therapy. And on the other end, you have more aggressive interventions, such as surgery, most commonly radical prostatectomy, and radiation therapy. In between, we have these emerging focal therapies. The focal therapies that are being researched right now include laser ablation, cryoablation, electroporation, photodynamic therapy, and ultrasonic ablation. Now, these are increasing in prevalence. For example, we're part of a multicenter trial dealing with ultrasonic ablation. So given that and the wide variety of treatments available, we really need to know as much about the tumor as we can. And MRI plays a critical role in this. But beyond just knowing how to characterize or diagnose a tumor, each one of these modalities or treatment options can use MRI differently. For example, with active surveillance, we can use MRI to perhaps prevent frequent biopsies or detect recurrence after a positive PSA but negative biopsies. But more importantly, with focal therapies, after they're performed, they're really the only way we know to diagnose recurrence because PSA becomes an unreliable biomarker because there's residual prostatic tissue. Right. Therefore, the radiologist really needs to know not only how to diagnose prostate cancer on MRI, but be aware of its role in these treatment options. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. So in your paper, after you review the typical MR appearance <clears throat> of prostate cancer, uh, you continue to describe the passive and active uh, approaches to treatment, uh, which with the passive approach essentially being, as you described, active surveillance, which you know, is sort of a little bit of a contradiction in terms. But can you review for us the concept of active surveillance in prostate cancer management? In particular, which patients would active surveillance be appropriate for? Sure, yeah. So active surveillance at its core is just when a patient has known prostate cancer, but is not, there no intervention is performed. So the patient is placed instead in a surveillance program. So typically patients who are in active surveillance are of low risk prostate cancer. But what does that exactly mean? What does low risk mean? Well, that depends on your institution. So there's a bunch of risk classification guidelines that are out there. The most commonly used one by the European Urologic Association, the American Urologic Association, is a three-tiered system of low, intermediate, and high risk prostate cancer. So a low-risk patient for active surveillance is one that has a Gleason score of less than or equal to 6, a PSA of less than or equal to 10, and stage T1C or T2A disease. Now, your institution may also imply, employ further criteria, such as the Epstein inclusion criteria, which is the most commonly included one, and that adds tumor volume, which is based on the percentage of tumor seen within cores and the number of positive cores that have tumor within them. Unfortunately, active surveillance is often misclassified, so 20 to 30 percent are not being put into active surveillance, which leads to unnecessary complications down the line, such as erectile dysfunction or urinary incontinence. Right. Well, that's great. So, um, you know, after talking about the active and passive surveillance, you begin then to delve into the surgical and radiation treatment options. Uh, which have sort of been the standard treatment options for people with localized prostate cancer for some time. Um, let's discuss surgery, and then maybe we can look at figures three and four, uh, which show both the normal uh, post-operative appearance on MR and, and uh, figure four, which shows an example, I think, of MR detection of local recurrence of disease. Sure, yeah. So figure three shows the characteristic findings of post-surgical changes after radical prostatectomy. 
the bladder and the levator sling have descended into the space formerly occupied by the prostate, and there's a new vesicourethral anastomosis. The vesicourethral anastomosis can have variable signal depending on the fibrosis that's present. Other things to look out for that aren't shown in this image are post-surgical collections, commonly abscess, hematoma, lymphocele, or urinoma. Um, figure four shows classic recurrence at the vesicourethral anastomosis, which is similar to the primary tumor, low T2, low ADC, early contrast enhancement. This is the most common location, but you should also be checking the anterolateral surgical margin, the space between the bladder and the rectum, and in seminal vesicles if they happen to be retained. A couple pitfalls to watch out for are fibrosis and residual prostatic tissue. Right. Well, thanks for that. So in detailing the imaging of patients who have received uh, treatment with radiation, you described a typical uh, post-treatment MR appearance of a decrease in gland size and obviously a uniform decrease in you know, T2 signal intensity, which makes the detection of recurrent disease fairly difficult. Uh, although, as you state, in the, it's the most common site of disease recurrence is in, the, you know, in, in that area. Uh, and this is in distinction to post-surgical recurrence, which is more common at the vesicorethral junction, as, as you uh, have shown us in Figure 4. Um, your paper then proceeds to discuss the increasing number of local therapies, as you mentioned earlier, including photodynamic therapy, uh, high-intensity focused ultrasound, HIFU, cryoablation, laser th treatment, and electroporation. But let's take a look at uh, cryoablation, which I think uh, it would be good to just review quickly which patients are candidates for cryoablative therapy. And then we'll look at figures 9 and 10, which show two different patients who received cryotherapy, and we'll review their findings. Cryoablation, along with the other focal therapies, are still developing their role in the treatment paradigm for prostate cancer. Sure. However, most papers suggest that cryoablation can be used in low, intermediate, or high-risk prostate cancer. And sometimes it can be used in salvage therapy after recurrence after radiation therapy. So cryoablation is when you insert needles into the uh, prostatic tissue under transrectal ultrasound guidance and infuse low temperature gases, eventually leading to necrosis of the tissue. Um, unfortunately, there's no consensus as to how much tissue to ablate, so most people end up doing a hemiablation, trying to spare the neurovascular bundle. So figure nine shows your normal appearance after cryotherapy. Uh, the first image is an axial T2 image, which is showing uh, the very low signal in the left prostate gland. And the key here is it also extends into the surrounding pelvic structures. Some of the therapies we talk about later may not do that. Um, also, the part B of the image shows post-contrast imaging that has no enhancement in the ablated area compared to the remaining prostate gland. And at level C, there's um, a little bit of asymmetry in both peripheral zones and a small amount of fluid in between the peripheral zone and transitional zone. And figure 10 shows a classic recurrence after cryotherapy. So on one side, on the left side, you have the normal post-surgical changes after um, cryotherapy. And you see the recurrence on the right anterior peripheral zone, which is low in T2, low in ADC, and not shown, but has contrast enhancement here. Right, great, thank you for that. So let's just move on to talk about laser ablation as, as a potential therapy. Can you describe how this procedure is performed and why it might be a preferred therapy as compared to the other local treatment options for, for patients with prostate cancer? Yeah, absolutely. So laser, laser ablation is when you direct a laser beam under MRI guidance to thermally ablate prostatic tissue. So the advantage of focal laser therapy over some of these other ablative measures is that it can be focused and directed since you're using MRI guidance, so you can localize it better as well. On top of that, you can use real-time temperature monitoring with MR thermometry okay. to really make sure that you're getting an adequate temperature to really ablate those tissues. It's important to note that you want to try to ablate a little bit more than the tumor itself because certain studies have shown that MR may underestimate tumor volume, um, and so that's a, a good thing to do. Right. And let's look at figure 11, which I think illustrates a patient who has received um, uh, laser ablative therapy for their prostate cancer. Right. So figure 11 shows the normal appearance after uh, somebody who has laser ablation, like you mentioned. Um, the first image is a pretreatment image that shows you the biopsy-proven cancer in the right peripheral zone. And immediately after ablation, on the post-contrast image, there is a large unenhanced ablation zone which has peripheral rim enhancement, which is a characteristic finding of these ablation zones. 
Uh, three months later, you get to see the long-term effects of this as there's architectural distortion, fibrosis, and shift of the volume towards the right, particularly the urethra. Great. Thank you for that. So you know, finally, you make an important point in the paper that uh, the role, uh, using the, the role of dynamic contrast enhanced uh, MR and also in diffusion weighted imaging, uh, in particular in the detections of, of d disease recurrence in patients who have undergone treatment. And I think figure 12 illustrates this nicely. Can we, can we take a look at this particular case, which I think demonstrates recurrent disease in a patient who had undergone laser ablative therapy for their prostate cancer? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, when we have these therapies, they tend to mess up our normal sensitivity of T2-weighted sequences given the post-treatment changes such as fibrosis or atrophy and loss of differentiation between the peripheral zone and transitional zone. So it's really key to use DCE, MR, and DWI to really pick out these lesions. This figure is a good example of that. It shows recurrence after focal ablation, focal laser ablation. And what it shows is a really low intensity ablation zone in the left paracentral peripheral zone. And there's a new mildly lobulated low T2 biopsy proven recurrence in the posterior left peripheral zone. The subsequent DC image shows focus of contrast enhancement, which corresponds to that low T2 signal. And also there's incidentally seen in the right peripheral zone, another focus of cancer. Great. Yeah. Well, Dr. Patel, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us today about your paper, which uh, is on the MR imaging of uh, patients who have undergone prostate cancer treatment, which again appears in the current March 2018 issue of Radiographics. Thanks we really so appreciate much. the opportunity. Thank you so us. much. Thank you.